Are we all affected equally by the eclipse? The universal fix. That's what an eclipse is. Eclipses have always been transformative, faded, and powerful, and so we still operate on them today. This is a time period where we get to release, and what does that mean? That doesn't mean bad, it doesn't mean ends, it means change. Eclipse is portents of the future and powerful sort of indications of where we're going next. And in this eclipse season, we are talking about starting new possibilities, new directions. That can be a transformative moment where the intentions you set change the course of your life. So one of the biggest, juiciest things that's gonna happen in 2024 is a Are you ready to shine? Shine bright. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've been wondering what the significance is of the upcoming solar and lunar eclipse and what it has to do with your future, then do we have the show for you. Today, I'll be talking with Dr. Michael Lennox, my all-time favorite astrologer, author of a brilliant new book, Psychic Dreamer, and creator of the Daily Astro Alert about the upcoming eclipses and what they mean for you. So welcome back to the show, Michael. Are you ready to shine? I am ready to shine as ever. Woohoo! Woo! <laughs> all right. Before we dive right into things and all things eclipse, what's with the energy in 2024? <laughs> it's been pretty crazy. It has been a difficult year and uh, uh, energetically, and it's not from a big sweeping astrological event like, say, 2020 was, right, where there were big transits. It's like, okay, this is going to be a big year. The difficulty energetically has been in smaller cycles, uh, uh, especially involving Venus and Chiron. So there's just been a lot of deep healing. We had a, a, a full moon in Virgo, uh, 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 you know, our last full moon that kicked a lot of people's asses. Because people forget that Virgo is not only ruled by Mercury, which provides the sort of analytic, uh, organizational, detailed sensation of that sign. But Virgo is also the sign ruled by Chiron, the great healer. So not only are we coming out of a couple of months where healing was big and Venus's movements are are digging us deep into the heart, Um uh, uh, we're also getting ready to go into eclipse season and Chiron has been part of everything, which is we're going to talk a lot about Chiron, the great healer. And so that's one of the reasons why I think 24 has been difficult is on a much more personal level through the principle of healing at the individual level, but all of us in the same sort of soup, uh, um, just our, our our journey driven by Chiron, the great healer is epic. And this eclipse season is all about it. Yeah, I just I just had uh, a, a unexpected uh, dental surgery this past week. I, I had a dental implant that we didn't know if it was going to make it or not. And because this is the year where anything that gets swept under the carpet is coming back up to be healed, I got an infection under it that required emergency surgery that pushed it out. Out, okay, <laughs> okay. That would you know, need to be cleared. <laughs> Saturn in Pisces is also something that will reveal otherwise hidden uh, karmic struggles and stuff because, uh, you know, Pisces is the, uh, the sign that invented the unconscious and things that are not readily noticeable or seeable. Um, so, you know, yeah, there's a, it's been quite a year. So let's go from that. I know we're entering eclipse season. What does that mean? And then can you give us a good definition for everybody? So we're on the same same baseline foundation here, what a solar and a lunar eclipse are. You know, the, the, the cute little idea of turn it off and turn it on again. Have you tried turning it off and turning it on again? And that that's the sort of, you know, the universal fix. 
That's what an eclipse is. You can think of the beam of light that is constant from the sun is spreading out in all directions uh, uh, from its origin. And we live in the bask of that sun. And so there's a relentlessness to the sort of never ending conscious flow of awareness from the sun and our catching of that awareness. So it's like the light is always on. It's exhausting. And then every six months, click, click. We turn the system off. We turn the yeah. system back on. And there's even like a visual sense of that, really, with the shadow passing, blocking out the lights of the two luminaries. Uh, um, is It's almost a literal turning off of the light and turning back of the light on. So in some ways, we think of eclipses as transformative. They they change us in a way that a regular new moon and full moon do not. And so in some ways, the six months in between every eclipse is what we're gathering and collecting data from that at the eclipse, we integrate everything we've learned for the past six months. We shift and change in a way that's more transformational than the average new moon and full moon. Um, and we have thousands of years of history of eclipses as portending future events, which I don't think is quite as germane anymore because we have such a fast paced world that's all connected. And it's like in the old days, an eclipse meant something bad was going to happen in the future. And right. it's like today we know that bad stuff happens all the time and eclipse only happen every six months. So, yeah, but we still have to incorporate the sensibility of eclipse as portents of the future and powerful mm -hmm. sort of indications of where we're going next. Um, that is also sort of in the definition of what an eclipse is for us. Thank you. And I want to get into a little bit more of the mechanics for people in a minute, the moon, the sun. But it's interesting. I was I was fortunate and blessed to be at a totality um, of an eclipse uh, a few years back in North Carolina. And and I'm out in a kayak. So is my wife, Jessica, kayak next to me. We're bobbing up and down. There are clouds all around. And it's magical. I go, I know the clouds are going to part. It had been just raining. The clouds parted just as it went to full eclipse. A corona shoots oh. out. What was amazing was the silence. Yeah. I've oh, never man. heard because there were birds chirping and you know, all animals and all things. And it went to you talk about a reset button. Nothing. Mm. Beautiful. That's that's what you're talking about, yes. isn't it? Well, yes. In fact, when you stand under the totality. Uh, uh, of an eclipse and experience that blackness uh, uh, face on. Um, I think this is one of the reasons why too eclipses weren't ubiquitously, you know, fated because you only see the totality in a small strip of the earth. So, you know, you could be hanging out in Scandinavia, you know, 3000 years ago, and you're only going to see a total eclipse every, I don't know, X years because we don't see every eclipse totally all over the world. But by virtue of you just describing that, you're giving us, your listeners, a sense of that turned offness, that darkness is valuable to us. It's not unlike REM sleep, that if we if we don't sleep and go into a kind of, I, I, I sometimes call sleep the, the sweet death of sleep. If we don't go into that sort of sleep state to rest and restore to in order to meet the day uh, that comes when we wake up, we, we can't function as well. And so the same thing could be said for eclipses. If we didn't break that relentless beam of light, we would be overwhelmed by the influx of data. And so that breaking of the beam every six months is like a breath for us. We need to have you talk to my kitty cat because he's been doing my be his best to get me up at least three <laughs> times a night, more than when our baby was a baby right That's now. Very funny. So what what is it? What is the mechanics behind an eclipse before we then look at, at north nodes and south nodes? What, what's going on here? Well, there's a perfection of how our solar system is set up vis-a-vis -vis the size of the moon and the size of the sun. I, I don't have this data down accurately, so forgive me for you science nerds out there who know what I'm saying might be wrong or off, but it's 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 like a 400% differential. Like the sun appears to be like four, it's either 400 or 40 or anything. The point is the proportion of what it looks like from our perspective to see the moon, it's like that shape. And from our perspective to the sun, 
it's the same shape. Let me pause exactly. you for a second there. Yeah. Exactly. Meaning. Exactly. Ain't no coincidence. This That's is not a planet where it's just a right. little bit off. That's right. It is so perfect and exact that when the Earth's shadow is over the sun's visage from our perspective and you're in the totality, every inch of the sun is blocked out. That's why the corona spreads out like that in that beautiful way. But it is because of the perfection of this anomaly of the proportional size. There just has to be something to that that perhaps the Goldilocks of the area of being outside of a star, close enough to feel it's warm, but not so far that it's cold, not so close that you burn up, we call that the Goldilocks. It might be that the anomaly of life showing up could have something to do with not only the Goldilocks zone, but this phenomenon that we have of eclipses. I, I, I don't know that that's just a, that's my imagination going wild. I can't back that up. Well, that would mean that other that would mean that other planets that that are in the Goldilocks zone and share the same life as us would also be gifted with this opportunity. Maybe, maybe there's some like perfect recipe of size and distance. At any rate, the point is we have eclipses, and over thousands and thousands of years, as people looked up and codified astrological data that became what is modern astrology, eclipses have always been transformative, faded, and powerful. And so we still operate on them today. And so I know that because I've been an astrologer for 30 years, I can tell you about certain eclipses. Like there were eclipses that hit me so profoundly that transformed my journey. I will never forget those moments, but you understand I'm not talking about like, oh, I did a class and I uncovered a wound and healed it, or or I did some meditating and came to a vision that changed me. I'm talking about the eclipse changed my trajectory, right? And so I I believe in the power of right. So you as well, right? And so well, we 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 put out the prayer, the intention. We paddled into a little lagoon before we went out for the eclipse. And that is where we set the intention and 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 said prayers to call in our daughter Hannah. Oh, right. Cry. So there you go. <laughs> and and here and here we are. And there she <laughs> yes. is. And you used a moment in the solar system where the solar system was saying, OK, we're doing a little bit of like out of the ordinary magical moment here. And then you join it. You know, every every solar eclipse is just a new moon and every lunar eclipse is just a full moon. And we know what those mean on a routine basis. And in the new moon, we're just starting up new cycles and setting intentions. But when it's an eclipse, that can be a transformative moment where the intentions you set change the course of your life. And a full moon, which is ability to release something from the deep unconscious, becomes amplified to like psychic surgery when it's an eclipse. So thank you. So then take us to a North Node eclipse, a North Node eclipse season, South Node eclipse season, and which are we entering and why does that matter? Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the nodes of the moon first. So you understand what they are and how they help generate eclipses because they do. So the, the nodes of the moon are a vector of energy that shoot out in front and behind of a moving system. This is a phenomenon in physics. Most moving bodies create nodes. They're like waves of energy from the movement that aren't the forward movement of the thing itself, like an, like a secondary thrust of energy that comes from the spinning orbit of the moon around the earth, crossing paths with the spinning orbit of the earth around the sun. So you've got this big circle, earth orbit, little circle, moon orbit, and that little circle sits on top of the bigger circle. So now what I want all your listeners to do right now is to picture in their mind a large circle and a little small circle like a ring sitting on it. If you then imagine a vector of energy shooting out in front of the system and an equal and oppositional force of a vector of energy shooting out behind the system, that's the nodes of the moon. So the north node we think of as the future. The south node, we think of as the past. In fact, as you're moving through the solar system, there would be a node that is more in the direction of the way the Earth and the moon are moving. So 
It is, in fact, the angular alignment of Earth, node, and sun that generates the eclipse. See, the shadow is always existing, right? The, the light that emanates from the sun passes over the earth and creates a shadow. If you were hovering above the solar system and you looked down, you would see the shadow on the other side of the earth every day because the earth is solid and the sunlight creates a shadow. But when the nodes are in such an alignment that the earth passes through that nodal pathway, the shadow hits us, we see it. We're really moving through it, kind of like the tides, right? The tides don't uh, ebb and flow. They look like they ebb and flow. We're just moving through thicker and thinner water. Um, so it's similar to this, that the shadow always exists, but when the alignment is right, we move through the shadow and see it and get blocked. So if there's an archetypal meaning to the North Node as the future, and an archetypal meaning of the south node as the past, then wherever the sun is closest to in any particular eclipse season is going to make it either, and in this case we're in, a north node eclipse where the, the sun will be in Aries, the north node is in Aries, and that new moon that's in Aries in April, that is the total solar eclipse, is all about where we're moving forward to because the sun is near the north node. In six months, the sun will move halfway across the solar system and be aligned with the south node. And in that eclipse season, we would be talking all about faded opportunities to finish up with the past, release the past, handle it in such a way that maybe you can move in a new direction, but it's, you would be instructed by me to be focusing mostly on the full moon release and the past that you're trying yeah. to move away from. And in this eclipse season, we are talking about starting new possibilities, new directions. And in fact, with the sun in Aries, which is the startup first sign of the Zodiac, Really and truly, this eclipse season is about transforming our journey so that we can move more powerfully forward in a fiery Aries kind of way. Beautiful. And I definitely want to come back to that, maybe with a little less fire, but I want to come back to it. But I, I've got to ask, um, and, and I can think of lots of ways this pertains, but what is a wormhole in this case? And how long does that last? So... When I was first studying astrology, I had a teacher named Stephanie Azaria. She's actually still out there in the world. And she had this term of the wormhole that described the amplified energy in between eclipses. Now, I don't know if that's a Stephanie Azaria invention or if other astrologers use that, but I have always used that term because it was hers and she was my first teacher. So in quantum physics, a wormhole is a theoretical phenomenon that the universe could sort of fold in on itself and allow a particle to move from one place in the universe to another instantaneously, like to cross to the universe in an instant, which we can't do because of the speed of sound, uh, speed of light. It would take us, you know, forever to get to the other side of the universe. And you've seen wormholes depicted in an imaginary way in science fiction movies where you see that swirling tunnel of light and the, you know, the person or the spaceship goes into it and they zip off to the other side of the universe. So I think we call the period between eclipses a wormhole by just transferring the idea of zipping to another place in the universe with an analogy of shifting our consciousness forward radically far and fast and furiously because of the transformative power of the eclipse. Another reason to call it a wormhole is it's usually crazy energy and like life gets really bumpy and kooky during eclipses and wormhole is a good sort of evocative term to refer to, you know, a crazy amplified time where, where energy gets really bumpy and kooky. I would say that, that in... In owning this term, for me, 
it's just the period between eclipses. And if there are two eclipses as there are this season, because sometimes there's three or four, if there's two eclipses, for me, the wormhole is after the first one on March 25th and before the second one on April 8th, those are the two weeks that will be the most. Adjective, adjective, adjective. What do you know? Like crazy, bumpy, you know, things will happen. Things will be surprising and intense and amplified and bigger than typical. But one could also call the wormhole, and Stephanie did used to talk about this. I just, it was too much for me to take on the idea that if the first eclipse is a full moon on March 25th, which it is, it's a full moon in Libra, sun in Aries, moon in Libra, the new moon that's coming on March 10th, or the new moon based on when this goes out there, the new moon that came on March 10th started up the lunar cycle that the full moon in, in which the full moon is an eclipse. So one definition of the wormhole could be the whole freaking lunar cycle from before the first eclipse till after the last eclipse. So in some ways, the wormhole is like, you know, March 10th through about April, you know, 21st. Listen, the wormhole is just a, a, a cutism to alert people to expect intensity, amplification, unexpected things, the kind of intensity that eclipses offer, even just day-to-day -day buzzy. I'm very sensitive in my body to energy. It's one of the reasons why being an astrologer was sort of a, you know, an imperative for me. Um, and even just that, that during the eclipse season, I feel the buzz in my body a little bit more acutely. So I'd like to present the idea of the wormhole just to normalize the idea that they're intense and to like get people up and ready to take advantage of the energy as opposed to being afraid of it. Thank you. So on that note, you say we focus on forward movement but first we must release. So I'm guessing this is a time period where we get to release and what does that mean? The first eclipse is a full moon. So all, wouldn't it be sort of like nice and, and, and elegant if every, you know, first eclipse was a new moon and then the full moon was an eclipse and we could just call it, you know, a, a simple like lunar cycle, but it, it, it's, the universe doesn't work that way. And so we happen to start Rather than at the beginning, we kind of start in the middle because we start at the full moon and the ability to release stuff from the unconscious in an eclipse is deeply, deeply amplified. Um, and I like the idea that the new moon total uh, solar eclipse that's coming in early April, which we'll talk about in a bit, is such a powerful thrusting forward of intention setting uh, uh, um, fire, Aries fire. It's good that we get to release first. So when the sun is in Aries, we're very consciously aware of the, the, the me of the equation. The I'm first, I start, I go, I lead, it's my turn. Um, so that if the moon is in Libra and we are in release mode, then we're looking to release Libra shadow that would inhibit a more powerful self-governed startup courage and excitement. If Libra is the sign of harmony and balance and relationships, Aries is the me, Libra is the we. So Libra has the avatar of the scales of balance as its uh, uh, um, uh, sort of inhabitants, its character, right? So <clears throat> Libra is a sign where we understand that everything's a mirror, that love and relationship is a reflection of two human beings having a shared experience, um, that if I want to shift something out there, I got to remember that it starts in here, that life, in fact, is a mirror. So in a full moon, we're not releasing things that are elevated and powerful. We're releasing things that inhibit us from being more effective in the world. So back to the consciousness of Aries says, we're not in consideration of anything but me, my journey. So then the shadow of Libra in the consideration of a powerful my journey would be things like codependency, trying to keep the peace, not 
finding your own fire because you're so busy keeping everybody happy. That's a shadow of Libra. So in any full moon, we're looking to release the shadows of the archetype involved so that we can honor where the sun is sort of shining its light on. So in this case, in the full moon, because it's Aries Libra, it's very much about relationships mm -hmm. and uh, 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 intimate dynamics. So there might be a focus on releasing and letting go of things that are in your relationship experience. If that's part of your narrative, you can bet that the eclipse season is going to rock your relationships a little bit. That doesn't mean bad. It doesn't mean ends. It means change. You used an eclipse to create something enormously beneficial and beautiful to your life. So I want to make it really clear that even though we talk about intensity and power uh, in an eclipse, we, we want to minimize how frightened people are because there's great value in letting go of stuff that inhibits a more powerful Aries like, you know, readiness for people to take their lives and move further and faster and furiously. Thank you. <laughs> Faster, furiously, and fiery today. Oh, my. Um, are we all affected equally by the eclipse, no matter where we are on the planet? Oh, yes. What a great question, because there is maybe a temptation to think that the people within the path of visibility are more impacted than people who can't see the eclipse. And so... <laughs> Here's where we get the distinction between astrology and astronomy. It is a function of astronomy that you can see the eclipse like this swath across the United States and maybe not in South America, right? So it's astronomical that the shadow is going to band its way around this area of the earth and every eclipse is different, right? And so, you know, people are, in fact, people are traveling uh, to go see the eclipse. And I know that Texas is all upset and worried about, and, and who wouldn't be? You're going to got thousands of people coming in. Can you give us the exact, the exact dates of it astrologically again, uh, astronomically again? Well, the total solar eclipse is April 8th at 1123 AM Pacific time. That's one of the reasons why it will be so visible because it's right smack dab in the middle of the day in the United States. And that's why it will be very visible in a certain, but remember, it's only going to be visible in a narrow column of the United States, not, not anywhere, but, but in that narrow column. So the, the, the idea that an, an eclipse would only impact some people that's astronomical. And yes, only some people are going to see it. Everyone else won't. But now remember the idea of going back up into the solar system for this God's eye view, where we're like now we're watching the earth and the moon move through the shadow. The whole system is moving through the shadow, not just Nebraska. Right? That's astrological. So it's like astrology says we interpret Aries and we interpret Libra. And then you ask, where can I see it? And it's like, ask an astronomer. <laughs> so yes, the, the short answer is yes. Everyone on the planet is impacted completely and equally the same. Thank you. You've been talking about Aries before we go to Chiron, because it's really important that we dance with Chiron today. Well, we're going to be dancing with Chiron. Uh, you say the new moon total solar eclipse at 19 degrees Aries. So now we're in the solar eclipse, which is the new moon, April 8th. So we've moved through the full moon where we've released stuff that has, you know, taken us away from passivity and, you know, not being willing to start things up. And our new moon total solar eclipse on April 8th has the sun and the moon and Chiron exactly at 19 degrees. So that counts for me, yeah. right? Close by precision means we're considering our healing journey, but an exact and precise conjunction, sun, moon, Chiron, all at 19 is just a different animal. It's more I don't know, I'm just going to repeat the word precise, like as if that's going to give you more meaning. I I, I like the well, precision. I see these things all by design. They're not yes. by accident. Yes, it is. I love that. So by design, this new moon eclipse starts us up in a new 
set up like a new cycle because mm-hmm. it's a new moon. It's in the first sign of the zodiac, Aries, which means we're in the newness of the new year. In fact, at the souls, at the I always get these mixed up. I've got 30 years in astrologer and I have to stop when I think solstice equinox. Which one is equinox it? Equinox is in the middle. Yeah, equi. Yes. <laughs> That's what I have to do. I like, have to equi, do it equi. too. <laughs> 30 years I've been an astrologer and I'm not like a stupid guy. I, anyway, it's just the way my mind works. So, um, um, no, I got distracted. Right. So we have the equinox that puts us in the start of the astrological new year. So the new moon in Aries is always epic in the startup energy. Like when the sun moves into Aries, we're at the astrological new year, but it isn't really till the new moon in Aries hits that we're in the true like slingshot of the new year. And Chiron is right here. And so in, like directly right here. So I have to start that story with last summer. Okay. So back to the nodes of the moon and the placement of eclipses, where the nodes of the moon will tell you where eclipses are going to be. So it's the fact that the north node of the moon is in the sign of Aries that is making eclipse season happen when the sun is in Aries. So... A, the nodes move backwards. That's important just so you don't like lose your mind when I sort of describe what sign they're moving from and to. In other words, the yeah. last summer, the north node was in Taurus, but because the nodes moved backwards, uh, it was July, I think, that the north node moved into Aries. And that was a big shift. I certainly would have talked about it in my you know, mm-hmm. forecast for the year because it changes the trajectory of where eclipses are going to guide us for 18 months. So in July, you got the north node of the moon at like 29 degrees or almost 30 degrees of Aries when it changed signs. And you had Chiron hanging out at like, uh, like I don't know, 19 degrees of, of, of Aries. Pretty close. Not quite conjunct, but like eight or nine degrees apart. But what that signaled, if the north node is about the future that the entire collective is moving into, and Chiron is in the same sign. That meant that last summer there was a knowing in the universal mind that there would be a coming together of Chiron and the North Node that can only happen about every 50 years. Can I pause you for a brief second? I want to get I want to get a little bit more background for people who are going, what is Chiron? Oh, okay. Golly, yes, that's true. I forget that 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 we Chiron is one of the bodies that we work with in astrology. It's one of my favorite important ones because I've been on a healing journey my whole life. So Chiron, we call the great healer or the wounded healer. He His anomaly is, is that he's not from here. So all of the planets in our system were created in the vast disk of of material that was surrounding our sun in the early days of our solar system. And then within that disk, the gases and particles and pieces coalesced into planets. Chiron wasn't anywhere near here during that process. But once the solar system was sort of created as we kind of know it today, at some point, an asteroid or a comet from outside of our system was like flying by. And our sun's gravity grabbed him, pulled Mm -hmm. him in. And because he had his own gravitational pull, the orbit was very erratic and destabilizing. It wasn't a smooth, ecliptic uh, uh, orbit. So he was named for a mythological figure that wandered erratically. I, I'm very grateful to whatever astronomer named Chiron, because Chiron in mythology was a trainer, teacher, healer, helper. He knew the arts and the mystery and the cycles, and he certainly was an astrologer if there was such a possibility. He was also, he could train combat. He, in fact, was training Heracles in combat, and his hip was injured by Heracles' sword. It was a mortal wound. But Chiron is a centaur. He's half horse, half man. He's half God, which means he enjoys immortality. (laughs) Bad combo. Mortal wound and immortality. Very bad combo. So his message is that he wanders eternity erratically, transforming his perception of pain into something integrated 
so that he teaches us how to heal. He teaches us that we don't heal our wounds by having them magically go away. They get healed when we own them, when we live with them, when we love them a little bit, when we take them out of the closet and say, I'm not ashamed of this anymore. I can own that this has been part of my journey. And then the wound is transformed. So that's Chiron. And so if the North Node is about where the collective is going and Chiron offers the ability to heal the wounds so that the journey forward is more graceful and powerful, then the coming together of Chiron and the North Node is big for us, all of us. And because it's happening in Aries in a general way, um, it has to do with being able to start up the new year, the astrological new year, from the healing journey that we've been on our whole lives, but specifically from last summer when the North Node moved into Aries and everything that's happened since last July and this upcoming April eclipse is sort of incorporated into the experience of setting new intentions that come from not only a healed place because we've taken care of some wounds, but I sometimes will say Chiron's like Yoda because everybody knows who Yoda is and everybody can be like, oh, I get it. Now, if Yoda was a centaur, a half horse and a half man and not some little gnome <laughs> quality. You got to <laughs> blow Yoda up into a hot, sexy centaur and then you know what I'm talking about. But Yoda's a good example to say in this new moon, total solar mm -hmm. eclipse, we are setting the intentions with the power of our inner Yoda fully mm -hmm. aligned, but not distracted as much of uh, by our personal wounds, because since last summer, we've been doing more deep healing that sort of culminates in this new moon opportunity. And because it's in Aries, then we know a couple of things about how this is going to impact people. Certainly people in with cardinal signs uh, uh, as, as featuring in their sun, moon, or rising. That's Aries, Cancer, Libra, and Capricorn. Those are the signs that will receive that eclipse in a, either a conjunction, a 90 degree, or a square. Those are all conflict energies. So <clears throat> if you have sun, rising, or moon in you know Aries, Cancer, Libra, or Capricorn, going to be a wormhole of conflict. The fire signs will receive this energy very gracefully and easily. So Lee and Sag and Aries will have a more direct, right? And then the water signs will have a kind of a, a need to adjust a little bit. Um, uh, uh, so everybody's going to be impacted, but differently based on how your chart is set up. Is it then all about is the, is the key word that we use because there's there's a newness and new beginnings here, but also there's the the dropping of the old having to do with healing. Is that, is that the big word here? Is healing right now? I would say absolutely yes. If you're listening to this and you're feeling sort of scattered with how to focus to you know work with the eclipse as it's coming, healing it would be the watchword. What what has your healing journey been about? And because it's Aries Libra, which is the relationship polarity in astrology, Aries is self, Libra is other. So Aries Libra is about how we relate to each other in relationships. That will also be a place where healing will be playing out most dominantly would be how are your relationships transforming because you've been on a healing journey what do you need to let go of in the full moon on march 25th that inhibits your ability to show up more powerfully in your relationship experience with an emphasis on what you're bringing remember sun and aries it's it's about the i and letting go of the challenge of a better we you know, and then we move into the new moon on April 8th, hopefully freer of wound and blockage and challenge because the full moon, we just surrender to the, the release mechanism that every full moon is. And then we pour our powerful intentions into the new moon on the 8th. Thank you. And it, it sounds like if, if somebody, if you were in my school of mystics class, I wouldn't give you homework. I would give you what I call playtime exercises because uh, we've got enough work to do. So if I was to give somebody a playtime exercise, would it be to write down before the lunar eclipse what we want to release and then write down before the solar eclipse 
uh, eclipse, what we want to bring about or what that new beginning is that we're hopeful for. Absolutely. In fact, what you just described would be the top line way to go with any new moon and full moon is get your mind engaged and writing is better than thinking because it's more concretized. And yes, in the full moon, you might want to write out everything that you are ready to let go of every habit and pattern and relationship and person perhaps or dynamic in your experience. I love to take rituals to even deeper sort of expressions. And because we've got um, a lot of fire, I would burn everything you write because the ritual expands when you do more activities that signal something to the unconscious. And the unconscious doesn't know the difference between what is actual and what is a ritualized experience. And so if in that lunar uh, uh, eclipse, uh, uh, full moon on, on the 25th, I would have to look at the date, you wrote out all of the things we're talking about of all of the stuff that you've been activating to heal and release, and then you burn it. The unconscious clocks that as your readiness to transform those things because combustion transforms. And in fact, it's, I love that when you burn something, it becomes carbon. What is carbon? But the building blocks of all matter. So when you're writing something down and burning it, you're, transforming what was released into something you can build a new consciousness with. It becomes carbon, right? And I like to go further to uh, uh, with both the earth and water <laughs> so that it's a four element ritual. So after the air of writing and the mm -hmm. fire of burning, we take the ashes and bury them in your garden, in a house plant, outside your home, and then you water them a little bit as an added sort of ritual where now the consciousness of what you've transformed becomes the seeds that you're planting for the next sort of thing. And then you water it as a kind of completion of all of the elements. And if you want to, you could even spread this out, do the writing and the burning at the, at the full moon, do the planting and the, and the watering in the new. You, you could you could do this in all sorts of ways. You could do all four elements at the at the at the full and at the new, but knowing that what you're writing is releasing at the full moon and intending at the the new. Thank you. Now I, I, we're going to get into your your new book, Psychic Dreamer, a little bit at the end. But but I can't help but thinking um, of just how much we live in a symbolic world. And the powerful symbolism behind what you're describing. Well, it's one of the reasons why I love the dream world and the world of astrology sort of with equal passion, because to me, they're the same act. They're, they're both just wild storylines that have elements that make up those stories that hold interpretive meaning. I mean, a dream is a little more chaotic than uh, than an astrology chart uh, because there's cycles and systems there. But the but all of life is filled with symbols that we can interpret. I, in fact, I think that one of the best ways to work with a conflict that happens out in your world is to treat it like a like a living dream. What would how would I interpret this event if I if I had dreamed it, right? And so when we have eclipses that come along and we use the archetypal interpretation of the signs and the geometry that's involved, we are interpreting a very difficult world to understand, but we're doing the best way of contextualizing it, which is to offer an interpretation. Thank you. We're going to dive more into that. But before we do that, speaking of interpretation and contextualness, if that's even a term, we've got to go to everybody's favorite, Mercury in retrograde. Yes, 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 yes. So it is fortunate and unfortunate that Mercury is going to go retrograde as part of the eclipse season. The value. So let's talk about the value first. Thank you. If eclipses are transformative and powerful and we want to be very aware of everything that we're going through while we're moving through eclipse season, Mercury retrogrades are actually helpful. Mercury retrogrades get a bad rap because they're bumpy. We 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 like we 
I like to say we bump into the furniture a lot when the navigating mechanism of our mind, which is like looking where we're going, is turned around and sort of looking within. We can't see where we're going as well. So we bump into stuff. But for my money, I call any personal planet retrograding as if it were visiting the unconscious realms. So if Mercury is backwards, he's more in our unconscious than he is in our conscious spaces. And he's in Aries. So he's never that far from the sun. And so he's in the same sign as where all of the action is. And in fact, he goes into his like shadow right before the first eclipse. There's three sections of every Mercury retrograde uh, cycle. And the first one is called the, um, <clears throat> the retrograde shadow. He's moving direct, but he's moving over territory he's going to backtrack over. And during the, the, this first part of every Mercury retrograde cycle, we get all of the information we need to know uh, with regard to what's going to trip us up when he turns around and goes backwards because he's covering the same stuff he's going to cover again. So, it's interesting to me that that starts on March 18th, just six days, seven days before the first eclipse. So we should be paying attention to our thoughts, to our feelings, that's to what's going right. on, looking at the world as if it's a dream and getting real yes, specific about what am I seeing? data about where does communication break down? Where does a problem arise? Where do I bump into an old pattern that I'm, you know, thought I was free of, right? You want to be paying attention between March uh, uh, 18th and April 1st, because those are the days that Mercury is direct, but he's going to come back here. So he's offering hint after hint after hint after hint. And that'll be important because he will... Uh, uh, he'll be direct during the full moon, but he will be retrograde during the new moon. So that turnaround happens on April 1st. So just for, for the sake of that, there are people listening and they might be interested in this. I'll just give the rest of the Mercury cycle details. Uh, 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 that retrograde backward motion is from April 1st to the 25th. So that's the three weeks where we're bumping into the furniture and having all kinds of mishaps. So that's the backward motion. And then we're wrapping up from April 25th to May 13th. Um, and that's where Mercury's moving direct again, but he's been through it two more, you know, two times previously. So that's the arc of the Mercury retrograde cycle. Take advantage of it. We get to change how we think and perceive and communicate uh, at deep and powerful levels. Yeah, add that to an eclipse season and 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 it's both a boon and a problem. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, visuals always go through my head when I'm well yeah. all the time, but specifically when I'm talking with you. And I don't know if you've ever heard it this way or not, but but we can certainly talk about uh, being a direct and going retrograde as a bungee jump. <laughs> oh, absolutely. That's a perfect that's a perfect because you do go through things several times in a bungee jump, right? And the first well, you hit one that zero is zero point. <laughs> right. And the first pass is new. It's all new. Yeah. By the time you get to the second one, you've already familiar with the first trajectory. It's great. It's a great image. So the value of Mercury going into the unconscious spaces while we are doing eclipse work is good because that means that part of our thinking and perceiving mechanism will already be in the below territory. Even just this, sitting down and writing out what you're letting go of while Mercury is in his shadow, that's powerful because that puts your writing and contemplating of the patterns in you that you're working with, it puts it right into the Mercury retrograde process. So anything that any of us think, talk about, or ponder between March 18th and April 1st, will be integrated into us when Mercury goes retrograde during his retrograde cycle. So forget about eclipses. Just while Mercury's in his direct shadow, writing an inventory about what you're trying to let go of would be a valuable Mercury retrograde activity. But then add it to an eclipse season. Now we've got the mind in the unconscious looking about saying, what's down here that I need to work with? while the eclipse is busy doing its transformative work on us, where we release in the full moon and then set these powerful trajectory intentions that become more passionate, powerful, and effective because 
Mercury's in the unconscious. Thank you. I want to dive more into this in a moment. I just, I, 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 um, sometimes it helps to share personal stories. And, I, and, and we always, uh, as we're listening to you, we're always relating it to our own lives. April 2nd, 2006 was my first near-death experience. And uh, which was completely transformative, a, a new me in a sense. And I'm going, wow. So I really get to look at what I still get to let go of, <laughs> or that's coming back around before April 1st. And then April 2nd, boom, here it is again in the right. Sense. You're, 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 yeah, you're, you're sort of your personal, an, an, you know, anniversary of that event. Yeah. 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 Powerful. So talk to me about the, the, the bigness of this. And you, you talk about big extent, expansion, sudden changes for good. What do you mean by that? One of the things that is sort of happening in the background um, that will be part of the lunar cycle of the eclipses. Remember, we're calling the wormhole over when that April 8th eclipse hits because it's between the eclipses. But it's a new moon, right? So it means that the entire lunar cycle that starts on April 8th, we might not call it a wormhole if the eclipse is over, but it is a lunar cycle that was kicked off by an eclipse, right? That's big in and of itself. Granted, there's no further eclipse to deepen the eclipse season, but it's an extra powerful lunar cycle because it was generated by an eclipse. So that means that anything that's happening, both in the chart of the lunation and mm -hmm. or that will occur during the 28 and a quarter days of the lunar cycle has eclipsy mojo attached to it. So one of the biggest, juiciest things that's gonna happen in 2024 is a very brief meeting between Jupiter and Uranus in the sign of Taurus. Jupiter is about bounty, expansion, abundance, prosperity, joy, education, travel, all of the yummy stuff that we get to do in life that feels like why it's worth it being here is yeah. a Jupiter thing. Uranus is an outer planet, so it's more about our higher self. Jupiter's about our social self. In other words, all of that bounty and abundance exists in you know the Earth plane. It's not an abstract thing. Jupiter's abundance is from outside our front door to the edges of our communities, you know, whether even if it's the whole earth. Uranus is about the higher collective self and it's about awakening to jumping up to higher levels of conscious awareness. We call him the great awakener. It's also an energy of sudden and unexpected change. Knows no good or bad. In Uranus, it's like you just want to wake you up and you, it's, it's, oh, I've said this dad joke 7,000 times, you win the lottery and you lose your legs in a boating accident and both of you get to wake up to a higher level of conscious awareness. But Jupiter only works with expansion, abundance, prosperity, and yummy stuff. So they are coming together by conjunction on April 19th. So that's right smack dab in the middle of the lunar cycle that's kicked off by an eclipse. So it's important to remember that the new moon energy isn't just about that day and setting intentions, that if you if you either look at the chart of, of a new moon or you're being told this by me right now, the new moon chart has Uranus and Jupiter only like three degrees apart because, you know, a few weeks later, they're going to meet and have their little Congress. So that means that the entire eclipse season, not only does it have this powerful Aries startup energy, the presence of Chiron means in a way we, we face the year ahead. I don't know if I mean this entirely, but it sounds good. We face the year ahead and the intentions we set wound free. And I would encourage everybody to like think big because Jupiter and Uranus coming together within that lunar cycle does have, it contains a thrust of energy in the sign of Taurus, which is earthy, grounded, present in form. It's not an abstract idea to have more abundance when the sign that the gathering of planets is in is in the sign that invented, it's really nice to be here on Earth. It's the only sign where it is nice to be here on Earth. I think everywhere else it hurts. <laughs> but in Taurus, it's lovely. So that's 
I love that that conjunction happens inside a lunar cycle that's an eclipse that's in the thrust of the intention setting power that that sets us up for an entire year of movement. Woo so I can't believe I'm going to go there. I'm going to go from Jupiter. I'm going to go to Pluto. You know, this whole year is about Pluto in a, in a way. Last year and this year are the two years that Pluto is changing signs. And that's an enormous generational shift for us on the planet. You can think of Pluto as roughly spending 20 years in a sign. It's, it's, he has a very wide orbit, so he's, he spends longer and shorter in different signs. But it's roughly 20 years, which is the length of a generation. So part of why this time is so difficult and transformative is because of this ingress of Pluto and the two years that it's taking. This is not unlike what it was like in 2007 and eight when Pluto was taking two years to cross over between Sag and Capricorn and we were moving through the worst like, you know, uh, um, uh, housing market and the banking and the reset. I mean, that was crazy. Oh, yeah. That was Pluto. So what we're seeing now with technology and AI and the expansions that are happening in there. And then all of the breakdown in the world at the sort of governmental level of the presence of wars, the crazy election in the United States, all of that is also reflected by Pluto moving out of Capricorn where the old structures were being ripped apart. Capricorn invented life structures like banking and housing, right? That's why when Pluto moved into Capricorn, structures got ripped apart. And so the last 20 years, it, it, you don't need to be an astrologer to look at, just look at the news for the last 20 years. Structures are being ripped apart right, left, and center. Ideas about social constructs are being ripped apart. Like it's destroying America, right? This is a big, big problem for us here is the ideologies are so different that we can't find common ground. That's also... Pluto in Aquarius is recreating what we understand a global community to be. And because we're at the beginning of that process, we're more in breakdown than we are in construct. So that's why you turn on the news and you see what's happening out there is so destructive because Pluto is in fact sort of destroying the new world so that we can create it. So I just, I, I, I think it's important to talk about if this eclipse season, which to me does feel very personal because it's Aries Libra, Aries is always going to be out about the me of us. And so if we are individually moving through an eclipse season that really has the capacity to free us up of wound and move more powerfully and in more activated way forward, then we are better set up to be stewards of the whole system moving through these next epic couple of years where conflict is going to be greater and our job is to be resilient in advance and be willing to shoulder a world that demands that we transform who we're being so that we'll survive, so that we'll make it. And so that doubles down why it becomes so important for me that people use this eclipse to personally get the wounded out of the way so you can be a stronger participant in the new world that we're all trying to create collectively. So what does that mean? Yes. What else does it mean we mm, get to do, ought to do? I don't want to use the S word, but I will go there. Should do. <laughs> what else should we do? You know, Michael... I don't have an answer for you. Do you know what I mean? It's like as an astrologer, what you ought to do is honor what the solar system is doing. And if you did nothing but your suggestion of writing down the shit you're getting rid of at the full moon and writing down the stuff you want to create at the new moon, that's enough. Like that's enough. And anything else you should do would be based on that foundation, that it's we're all moving through life. We're all sort of distracted by our own sort of wounded journeys. Take some time to quit the distractions of what the journey is. Pull back in and think about your individual journey. What you need as an Aries me, I am, to you know release at that full moon. Just do the do as we've talked about it, um, and you know then just try to be conscious and loving. Ooh, I like it. I saw a bumper sticker recently. It's a local firefighter. 
uh, it has this bumper sticker and it's not MAGA. It is MACA. Make America kind again. Oh, honey, I'm all for it. <laughs> I'm all for it. You know, I will never be able to transform how I see the world in order to be really connected to a, a view that I don't hold. Like, I'm not that guy, but but I can be kind. I can be kind in the face of, you know, conflicting viewpoints. <laughs> So let's let's go from there. And I want to dovetail real briefly into your book because I was reading your book before we did this, this uh, interview and I'm going, where am I going to go? How am I going to weave this together? And I'm like, oh my God, I need to do a whole interview on this. So we're going to take just a little bit of time here on Psychic Dreamer, but I, I don't have enough superlatives for it because- <laughs> Oh, it, thank you, Michael. To me, it 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 is the adage that the waking world is the dreaming world. The dreaming world yeah. is, is 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 the waking, yeah. and and it's so true and it's so powerful. And now this whole interview, I have had this image stuck in my head from the beginning of the book of of um, a proton and a neutron and and how an atom is the solar system. Yeah. <laughs> the solar system is an atom. You know, I I remember having that awareness. Like I didn't I didn't. Well, I wasn't fed that as a child, right? But I saw it and I, I can still remember being seven or eight years old and being gobsmacked by that. Uh, and because my mom was sort of scientific and, 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 and imperial, you know, sort of empiricist, um, she was all about that. I mean, if I, if I got too into woo woo intuitive stuff, she's like, that's not real, <laughs> but sh that, that similarity is everywhere, Michael. It's not just the solar system and atoms. It's everywhere. You know, it's in our physical bodies at the way our nerve, you know, the nerves in the ear replicate the organs. A Chinese, you know, a physician can look at your tongue and see what your organs are doing because the map of your tongue matches the map of the of the organs like this. It's this replication is everywhere. And I think it speaks to the idea that everything is everything and the dreaming world is the waking world and the waking world is the dreaming world. Thank you. So let's let's go into real briefly into um, we're going to try to get as many of the key topics, just a just a taster. And then we're going to do a full interview and I'll, I'll do it as quickly as we can. I mean, I want to get you back as quickly as we sure, can. Sure, uh, I'm down. I'm get game. our calendars in order together. Uh, what can you tell us about lucid dreaming? Uh, lucid dreaming is at the simplest level, just when somebody has a dream and in the dream, they are come to the awareness that they're dreaming. It's as simple as like, oh, I think I'm dreaming. Nothing changes in the experience of the dream, but the awareness comes in. Uh, I can't imagine that anybody hasn't experienced that at least once in their life. But there is a way to experience awareness in the dream state at a much higher level. And this can be worked on and 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 as a kind of, as a kind of a muscle. I had an, a lucid dream experience once that in the arc of my whole life of 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 powerful experiences, this was one of the top. And it was just this wasn't that long ago, maybe 10 years ago, and the dream was just me sitting on my couch in my old home, my old apartment in Silver Lake as awake and alert as I am right now. As physical as I am right now but i was dreaming and i was like i'm dreaming i'm asleep right in that room and i'm but i'm here i'm on my couch and i and then i woke up <laughs> <laughs> but it was so talk about the everything is everything and everything replicates that was a moment when the dream and the real life was indistinct and that's the power of lucid dreaming because it's direct evidence that waking life and sleeping life are the same thing. And the only thing that makes them separate is our perception mechanism that is designed to keep us awake when we're awake and go to sleep when we're asleep. Um, one of the ways that people increase their lucid dreaming is to, the technique is you look at your hands all day long. So you would look at your hands 20, 30, 40 times a day, every day, every day, every day. Just look at your hands. That's it. The idea is that eventually you're going to be in a dream state. You're going to look at your hands in the dream and you're going to be woken up in the dream to an experience of lucidity. People who have that level of lucid dreaming can 
go back to dreams that they woke up from that they enjoyed. I've heard that talked about all the time. I've had people who were avid lucid dreamers who like called forth uh, 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 an interview with Marilyn Monroe just by setting the intention for weeks and weeks. And one day he had a dream and she's like, hi, I'm ready for my interview. But the reason why the hands thing works is because in REM sleep, we're also reviewing everything that we've done during the day and the brain is forming memory. We really are reviewing stuff. That's why we often dream of stuff that happened during the day. That's why looking at your hands during the day is eventually going to show up in your dream state because at some point, your brain's going to be filtering through all the things your eyes saw that day. So that's all you need to know to start your lucid dreaming journey. A, a, a last piece on it. Would you add in asking yourself, am I awake or am I dreaming or not necessary? Well, I mean, I think that if you can be conscious enough to ask yourself that question, then you are already lucid dreaming. <laughs> no, no, I mean, in the, in the waking state, uh, am I awake? Am I dreaming? You put your hands out. Am I awake? Am I dreaming? Because it becomes a trigger. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't advise against that. I mean, I've not heard anybody describe doing that. It sounds a little bit like a, a, a leftover from the movie Inception, <laughs> but I haven't seen that movie of all things. I, you haven't seen that, oh, Michael. You gotta watch that. I have not seen Inception. I can picture them in the in the. Okay, well, I will, I will, I will then go and see Inception. You brought up, and and then I want to, I want to dive into past lives. I, I got it's two and a half years since I got hit by a car when I'm on my bicycle. I get hit by the car, knocked unconscious. I'm in the, I'm in the ambulance. Um, I'm off in La La Land. I'm meditating. I'm actually in my dream meditating. And I believe I know that I'm in a dream or in the dream world, but I'm getting into such a beautiful, peaceful state wow. that when I woke up, I was in a state of gratitude. I was doing what's, what's common for me. So it was an expression I was going, I was going, thank you. I woke up and I was basically in my mind's eye, still in Lotus or half Lotus going, thank you, angels. Thank you guys. Because of that state I'd been in of meditation right. on the other side. You know, I, first of all, I think this speaks to, that's why you sit in that chair. Like part of mm -hmm. why you sit in that chair is because you've called forth a life where you are available for such experiences. And this speaks to the idea that, that, that sleeping and waking is not an on off switch. It looks like it. It looks like we're on when we're awake and we're off when we're asleep, but we're not. It's a, it's the whole thing is a vibrant experience of the same sort of thing, needing to tap into the highest energetic functioning of you so that you could survive that accident. And in fact, thrive afterwards. I, I love that. Thank you. Well, let's, let's go from there. And I, and I just looked at my clock and it said four, four, four to me, that means angels and angels are with us and they're helping us. But <laughs> so I'm like, thank you. Let's talk about past lives and dreams. The first time I ever had the idea that dreams might reflect past lives was just simply in hearing a dream and saying out loud, God, this sounds like a past life. And um, no, I don't know. Like, I can't tell a fabulous story of, oh, the first time that happened, I was 23 years old and hearing a dream. But like, that's <laughs> how I sort of came to the idea that dreams might sometimes be bringing us there because there are, in fact, dreams that feel very much like environments, that there's a way that a dream seems to take you to a time frame or a town and an environment that is more like watching a movie than having a crazy dream. And so when I reached out to my following for stories and examples of this, I wasn't disappointed that there were in fact people who believed that they were having past life dreams and then the dreams that they shared matched the same sort of cogency that I've experienced when someone told me a dream and I said out loud, this sounds like a past life that we're connected to perception that isn't limited by our waking mind because we're connected that profoundly. Let's go from past lives. Let's go real briefly to another good one, cool one, or booga booga one, visitation dreams. Oh, you know what I love about visitation dreams, Michael, is listening to someone tell me that they were transformed by the experience. I have had several of those interactions with people where cheerfully they said i didn't believe in these things until i had this experience they feel very profound like anybody who's had a visitation dream will tell you that they are 
different significantly. And what I've noticed uh, since I've you know listened to thousands of dreamers over the years is that visitation dreams are always singular in setting. Like they don't they don't take place in dynamic settings. In fact, one of the most frequent settings for a visitation dream is the bedroom in which the sleeper is dreaming. And grandma comes in to the room. That's the primary one. Another one, ironically, and I, I think I, I might have written about this uh, uh, if it wasn't too tongue in cheek. A lot of benches. If you have lost somebody and they show up in your dream and it's more typical, like you're moving around space, I would not call that a visitation. I would call that a, a process dream that the dreamer is having that involves the person who is, has left. Um, but again, those moments have been just so rich to just watch somebody talk about how they completely transformed their perspective of what life is and how this place you know, works because they lost somebody dear to them that showed up in a dream and they were like, that was real. Like, I don't care what anybody would say. I will defend to the death that what happened was bona fide. And I think that kind of comfort is beautiful. Plus, if you think back thousands and thousands of years as our forebears were gathering around the campfires, what were we talking about? The hunt and our dreams, right? And so if we lost grandma, uh, you know, 4,000 years ago, sitting around the fire in the Serengeti. Um, and someone said, I visited with grandma. And someone else said, me too. Suddenly Ooh. the human race is going to create constructs that take into account the felt experience of multidimensionality that shows up in dreams. And suddenly you have an other side rises up in the human psyche because you got people saying, they're gone, but I felt them, they visited, and then the human race creates another side and mythologies and spirituality and a sense of the divine. It all starts with us sharing our dreams around the fire. Well, you just, and, and you just accidentally used a very, accidentally and non-accidentally used a very important word that I wasn't going to go to, but why not, apparently? Shared dreams. Yeah. <laughs> that was a surprise to me because I've, never knowingly had a dream that someone else had at the same time. Um, but when I was writing a book years ago, I um, just knew a woman and knew that she had a, a crazy dream experience. And she told me about this experience that she had with a best friend, that they were very close and deeply spiritual in both of their experiences. And they had several experiences of shared dreams. So I knew to ask about this. So when I put out the word that I wanted samples, experiences of people having shared dreams, it was crazy how many responses I got. And what, what occurred to me was, is that if we were talking about our dreams more consistently in our immediate communities, I'll bet you we would find that we're sharing dreams way more often than we know. But if you don't talk about it, how can you know? It tends to happen when high, when the stakes are high and people have to be close. It, it can't, like, I don't think I'm going to share a dream with my landlord who lives in the big house up there. I think it'd be a great idea as a family, you get up in the morning and there are communities that still do this. The Oshawar people, from what I understand, uh, uh, Ecuadorian rainforest, uh, yes. they get up as a people and they, they yes. share their dreams, which then guide them for the day ahead. I think we've lost that in community and it's, uh, 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 it, it, it is an incredible way to mix the waking life journey and the and the behind the scenes energy that we can't perceive directly, but that we are working with every minute of our lives. And by sharing dreams, we're sort of calling forth the mystery and the invisible to be more present. How do we know if a dream is a, a, a prognostication or prophetic, it's something about the future versus something that is in the zeitgeist of a nightmare, for instance, that's to be cleared. How do you tell the right. difference and can our dreams predict the future? You know, I wish that I had a like a clear, clever answer about how you can tell the difference because you, ultimately you can't. Absolutely, dreams are precognitive. People uh, have been having precognitive dreams since the beginning of time. Um, sometimes they're as innocuous. I tell this story in the in the book. My first precognitive dream was just me dreaming of sitting in a circle with my legs crossed. And then like a week later in gym class, sitting in a circle with our legs crossed because we had to have a little meeting of the class. I was like, I dreamed this because I was so insatiably curious about 
phenomena such as intuition and perception, right? So to me, that was like the most exciting thing ever. And it led me forward with my exploration of all of these things, because as a teenager, I was already interpreting dreams. I read Freud's interpretation of dreams at 15 years old. So I was standing in high school hallways going, tell me what you dreamed. I'll tell you what it meant. What I used to experience years ago was is that most people who said that they were precognitive dreamers, it was something that they knew that was part of their life and most likely ran in families. Like, you know, I had met a lot of people who said, oh, yeah, my mother and my grandmother also had this gift. What I've noticed in the last 40 years, though, is, is that I don't hear that anymore. I hear lots of people talking about having precognitive dreams, not just those whose grandma and great grandma did it. Because I think that the, we are accelerating. The human mind is amplified in how we you know, are moving through you know, consciousness. And so I think that people are having more intuitive dreams. The problem is I don't really know that you can tell outside of your own learning your own vocabulary. Now, that's a totally different story, Michael. Meaning, I can't tell you what to look for, but you can. You can keep track of your dreams and see which ones are precognitive. So many people have dreams. Mm. Massive fires, end of the world, uh, uh, complete destruction. What, is that? what does that mean? What's going on with those dreams? Well, apocalyptic dreams are standard. They're part of our vocabulary. Yeah. And so when I would hear an apocalyptic dream, I'm not thinking about the world. But if you're dreaming about the end of the world, it's not because it's coming tomorrow. It's because something is changing radically in your life, so much so that a good symbol to represent it would be ap you know, uh, apocalyptic change in the outer world. We're going to talk much more about your book, Psychic Dreamer in the Future. How, and, and thank you so much for sharing. So what I need to know is where can people go to find your work, to find your book? And I hear you have an upcoming class and to find that as well. Yes, michaellennox.com is the place to go. In fact, the book, Psychic Dreamer, is available everywhere books are sold. I have a link to Amazon right there on my website. Um, but also, michaellennox.com is where you can find my social media connections because I do a lot in the world of astrology on TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. Um, so all of those links are there. And yes, I have one of my signature classes. It's one of my absolute favorites. It's always a slam dunk, hugely attended class. It's called Finding Your Voice. And I sort of combine a kind of shadow work exploration dive to the patterns and the, the childhood experiences and the way you were sort of formed in your young life to have or not have a strong and powerful voice. I teach the actors vocal warm up so that people who want to actually physically increase their resonance can do that. It's not a class about using the voice. I offer that as you can change the resonance of your voice. But I love this class because it combines things that I'm passionate about, self-exploration and dealing with wounds that inhibit us and focusing it primarily on, are you expressing yourself powerfully? Do you have a strong yes or no? Can you set boundaries and can you use your voice more powerfully? And if there's stuff in the way of you doing that, this class helps you explore and release. And it starts like March 30th. It's like, it's coming in like, you know, a few days. We'll get the link down below. Do you want to share that with people as well? One more time. MichaelLennox.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any last brief words, brief words you want to share about the eclipse season and everything that's coming right now? Don't fear the eclipse. Trust that the solar system is simply taking us through something that we are expecting, that we've been primed and prepped for it. It's in the natural order of things. It's part of the unfolding. It's not some extra added thing that's going to trip us up. It's the next indicated expansion. Have at it. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, dive in, get those things down before the lunar eclipse, before their solar eclipse, know that it's here to serve you and above and beyond all else, shine bright. Woohoo! Wow, wow, wow. What a special, beautiful, powerful, important, prescient interview on our upcoming eclipses and on the eclipse season. How does it get any better than this? Well, if you want to raise your energy up, 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 and way up. Come join me and get a daily attunement of vibrational goodness 
with our daily newsletter, dailywoohoo.com. That's dailywoohoo.com. And if you want to learn how to live above the clouds, above the mountain, in the silence, in this grace, space of grace, plugging into the power of the universe at the highest vibrational level, come join us for our School of Mystics, live or recorded four times each month, plus the most profound clearings each and every month to help get you light. And the link is down below to join us in the School of Mystics. And of course, if you want to learn how to connect with the other side, to use automatic writing, to speak with your angels, to speak with your guides, to speak with your loved ones on the other side, simply come to automaticwriting.com. That's the link right down below, automaticwriting.com. Here's the link to the next amazing show. Love you so, so much. Keep on shining bright. Woohoo! <laughs> how does it get any better than this? Lots of love, everyone. Shine.